Hi everyone, welcome again to another financial analysis video with myself, Moe Damin, and my colleague, Ted Wayman. Uh, today, we're gonna to be looking at the second largest distillery uh, business in the world, and that is Diageo. Um, but before we get into Diageo, uh, just a quick note, of course, like, share, subscribe. Um, you know, just a reminder to everyone, this video, and I know some people skip over the intros of the video to get to the good stuff, Hopefully, if you're listening to this, this is important. Um, these videos that Ted and I are putting out are not designed to help you make, um, to kind of educate you on investments or anything like that. We are, we, are, um, we are interested in helping raise the knowledge and skills for people to be able to read financial statements uh, and to be able to understand and analyze those financial statements. So that is the purpose for these videos it is not going to be looking at the future we're looking at the fundamental financials now how you use that information is entirely up to you it is very important for whichever way you're going to use it so whether it's part of your investment thesis whether you want to use this as part of your sales strategy if you're looking to sell to a company like GIDO, or if you're looking to you know if you're going to have an interview with them or someone similar to them in their market there is no smarter way to come across to an interviewer and I've been an interviewer to hundreds of people, then if you talk about the fundamental financials and what your contribution is going to be to that. So let's talk a little bit about Diageo. Um, Diageo is, as I said, second largest distillery in the world. They have uh, you know, about 200 brands that they are selling in 180 countries around the world. And these are brands like Black Label, uh, Bailey's, Smirnoff, Guinness, um, and, and a whole host of others. Now, in 180 countries, they have 138 production sites in the world, and they employ, if I look at the, the latest numbers that I can see, 27,650 staff around the world, so very sizable business. Now, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, it's a public company, so we're going to look at the share price, uh, so stick around for that, but just to give you some headlines, they went public in uh, 1988, now, if you are a long-term investor and you stuck around, you would now be sitting on a 7,970% uh, growth, which is quite sizable. In the last five years, it's 167% growth. And then the last year, it's 128% growth. Doesn't mean there weren't any ups and downs. They're absolutely aware. So stick around. We're going to talk about that a bit more. Uh, but for now, we're going to look at the uh, fundamental financials uh, and help you kind of understand and analyze and draw some good good information out of those so ted what do we have for our for our viewers today okay well thank you very much moe good to see you again um yeah so this uh, analysis is actually a request of one of our viewers um liam kellaway uh who um uh, was very persistent um uh, and asked twice if we could have a look at diageo so this is for you liam uh, and once again um do uh, remember to, you know, if you'd like us to look at a company, um, do uh, message us uh, and we will see what we can do. Can't promise. Um, we do get a lot of requests coming through, um, uh, so we can't do all of them, unfortunately. And if you want to give us a bit of backstory, you're more likely to push yourself um, up the list. So rather than just saying, look at this company, give me a reason why you're looking at it. Are you interested in investing them? Are you supplying to them? Are you buying from them? Uh, are you potentially going to join them? And you want to get some insight on an interview. And if you are going to do that, give us a date of your interview. We'll try and get it out before then. So with that in mind, let's have a look at their financials. So uh, this is it's a listed company. Um, uh, and so their annual report is available on their website. Just uh, look under the investor relations tab and you will find this very large document and it will provide you with lots of information about all of the brands and the people who are running the business and what their strategy is and their approach to the corporate and the environment and ESG and how much they get paid and what their strategy is and all that other kind of mush that um, uh, companies come up with. Uh, I'm sure it's not mush. I'm sure it's, it's very, very important information, but we are interested in the financial. So we're going to be sticking uh, to the financial part, uh, which is on page 140. Two, I think. Here we go. So um, here is the income statement. So um, first of all, we are looking at the uh, column in bold. So we're looking at the year ended June 2021. You'll notice that we are quoted in millions of pounds. So top line is the sales, uh, which is 19,000 million. That's 19 billion, nearly 20 billion pounds. 
Now, interesting enough, um, these guys do something which not a lot, in fact, very few other companies do, is that they, first of all, they say, uh, look, we're going to deduct the excise duty. So basically, they want to say, look, here's the sales. Look how much money we have to pay in tax at the top line. Now, very few other companies have to do that. But obviously, uh, alcohol is a nice vice. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, it's uh, attractive to governments who like to tax them. So they're being taxed on their sales rather than on their bottom line. So they've made a very specific point. So all the numbers I'm going to quote are quoted of this net sales number. So this net sales, that's really their true top line. Um, so these guys are going to just showing uh, kind of you know gross sales, including um, excise duties as well. So gross net sales uh, after deducting any excise duties, uh, about $13 billion. The cost of sales, $5 billion. Uh, that's about a 40% um, uh, cost of sales, which leaves them with a 60% gross margin. Now, worth bearing in mind that these guys own some pretty top uh, uh, top shelf brands. Um, and uh, what we're really saying is that, you know, when you buy that brand, when you buy that bottle, every dollar you pay, it only costs them 40 cents to actually make the content. And the rest uh, is going as, as a gross profit. So the gross profit of about uh, 8 billion. Although, of course, actually, in, in terms of what you pay, uh, you're paying this number up here uh, and a fairly substantial chunk um, that's over 25% is actually going in tax, first of all. OK, so you can work out the math if you want that. Um, marketing, very big number on marketing. Um, so, you know, investing in these brands um, and then operating costs. Now, uh, just as a little aside, um, I, I thought this was quite interesting. I'll highlight it. I don't know if there's I've got any in, in, any other information, but the 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 marketing costs in 2021 are uh, almost exactly the same as the operating costs in 2020, which are the same as the marketing costs in 2019. Meanwhile, the, uh, the operating costs in 2021 are almost exactly the same as the marketing costs in the previous year uh, and the, uh, the um, uh, operating costs in the year before that. Now, I don't know whether somebody's just got themselves muddled and got the numbers the wrong way round or whether that really is, but it was just an interesting observation uh, on that pattern that kind of slightly jumped out at me. So uh, I wouldn't read too much into that, but you know what they're saying is that they spend a lot of money on marketing uh, these brands. And if you think about it, you know, you walk through duty free, there's usually somebody there with a kind of a tray of, you know, uh, I don't know, whiskeys and, you know, do you want to try one? And you're like, it's eight o'clock in the morning. I really don't. Well, okay, go on then. Maybe one or two just to kind of see me on my way. Um, you know, all of that kind of investment. So that brand sponsorship will all be in there, um, uh, you know, all very important to, uh, you know, to promoting, you know, these premium brands and being able to command uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the high levels of profitability that we're, we're seeing. So looking a little bit further down, we've got our finance charges. Um, uh, so uh, again, you know, finance charges aren't, aren't excessively large. Um, and we just compare those to the operating profit to suggest that these guys have got debt on the balance sheet, as we'd probably expect. Um, you know, they'd have grown, they'd have grown by buying um, uh, uh, brands and uh, they'd have funded those brands through um, uh, through the issue of debt as well as possibly equity. Still, um, bottom line, very profitable, very profitable business here. Here we go, $2.8 billion uh, uh, up from the previous year. The previous year- $2.8 you know, billion, pounds, right? Billion pounds, sorry, yep, so the uh, uh, 2.8 billion pounds. So I'm always forgetting which currency I'm in. And um, one of the drivers of the kind of the loss or, or the lower profitability in 2020 is probably this number here. I mentioned they were the same. You know, obviously it's it's a billion dollars um, uh, uh, higher, um, uh, or, or you know, so you know exactly. There's an extra kind of billion dollars of costs. We can look at note three if we really want to find out about that uh, as to what it actually relates to. But um, uh, and and then we're back up at the profitability in the previous year. So it looks like they've taken a big hit somewhere in there. Could have been restructuring costs, something like that. Um, year ended 30th of June 2020. Um, you know, that could have been, um, you know, a reaction to the pandemic uh, and some big uh, cost um, going through that um, uh, as, as a result of that, uh, when the pandemic hit. Anyway, core profitability looking pretty good. Um, if we scroll down a little bit further, uh, I'm just going to highlight the, um, the earnings per share. Um, so earnings per share, 113.8 um, um, uh, pence per share. Um, two years ago, it was 130. So it has dropped 
um, since then. Uh, last year, it was you know uh, quite a bit lower, but that's because of this kind of dip um, uh, in the profitability, probably due to this uh, this kind of one-off hit uh, on the uh, operating costs. Um, so you know, difficult to kind of look at those three and, and, and pull out necessarily a trend from that. Um, a little bit further down, we come to the um, to the the balance sheet. Just find my balance sheet. Here we go. Um, so here's the balance sheet. Um, Non-current assets. Those are the things we need to run the business. Um, Twenty, nearly twenty-one billion pounds. Um, biggest number there is um, uh, the eleven billion pounds of um, intangible assets. Intangible assets. Those uh, you can look at note nine if you want. But you know that's going to really be goodwill. Um, that's going to reflect that these guys they've grown through acquisition. You know they buy brands. That's what they do in order to grow the business. They've also uh, bought a lot of property, plant and equipment. So they'll buy a business and then obviously they've got to replace the, the, the distilling process or the, or the brewers, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they've got quite a lot of investment. So uh, they don't own 100 percent of everything. They're going to have a lot of kind of, you know, 20 percent over here, 40 percent over there, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all the way up to 50 percent in the joint ventures. Um, on their current assets, um, quite interesting. Big, big number here. So inventories, again, very, very large. We've seen this in other drinks companies that we've looked at. They hold a huge amount of inventory. I mean, really quite a surprisingly large amount. Um, and, and I don't know the business that well as to why that is, you know, whether that whether that kind of includes, I don't know, I mean, you know, it may be that they've got, you know, work in progress and that might be your kind of, you know, your 10 year single malts, uh, which obviously, you know, we're going to distort that because they're going to be sitting in the inventory in the work in progress and it takes 10 years to mature. So wouldn't surprise me if that's going to, you know, that's going to have an effect, <coughs> but it will, you know, it, it is kind of driving um, you know, the, the, the cash flow of this business. So, you know, these guys, they've got a lot of money tied up in their inventory, you know, not necessarily slow moving, um, but it may be, you know, a, a lot of kind of, you know, those, uh, the, those long-term maturing um, uh, assets, um, uh, which, uh, you know, basically they've got cash tied up in. Um, if we go down to the bottom half of the balance sheet, let me just scroll this down a little bit. So um, we'll just keep that current assets figure on the screen if we can um, uh, and so uh, the current liabilities um, of about four billion uh, really not a problem for those current liabilities uh, if we compare them to the current assets of uh, right at the top of, of about 11 billion um, uh, and therefore liquidity does not look an issue for these guys um, there is uh, quite a lot of borrowings on the balance sheet. We expect that. We can see they're paying interest. They can afford that interest. And if they can afford the interest, if they've got good interest cover, it means that they can refinance that debt. They can roll it over. It's not a problem. Although um, be aware, if you are looking at businesses with a lot of debt, um, you know, there's a lot of inflation around and inflation tends to lead uh, to higher interest rates from central banks. We'll be uh, uh, interested to see whether that actually uh, uh, happens or not um, uh, and therefore can create headwinds for companies who have too much debt. A little bit of short term debt as well. Um, uh, and we can take those two numbers together as the total debt and then compare that to the equity that's funding the business. There's the equity down the bottom uh, and mainly funded through retained earnings. So these are profits. Uh, that the business have made they're reinvested back into the business okay um so pretty healthy looking balance sheet um you know quite a lot of debt um mainly debt funded but um it can afford that debt and it, that doesn't seem to be a major problem for these guys uh scroll down a little bit further um so here we're looking at the movement in equity um and just to highlight um, I just want to pull out where do I want to go down to? Here we go. So I want to just we're looking at this column here, which is the kind of this is the retained earnings column. And you'll notice here that there is a share buyback as well as dividends. Um, so, uh, again, in this year, uh, just gone uh, 2021, there was a little bit of a share buyback, 200 million, so 200,000 um, sorry, 200 million uh, pounds uh, and a dividend of 1.6 billion. Uh, the dividend very consistent. So they're, you know, they are consistent dividend pairs. If you're an income investor, if you're kind of, you know, often you'll find that pension funds who are, you know, they've got to pay out their pension. You know, they like to buy income rather than capital growth, so to speak. You know, this will be a favorite of theirs. Um, share buyback. 
you can see the previous year 1.3 billion and it's only 200 um, million uh, in this year compared to last year. So, uh, uh, you know, decisions there, you know, maybe the share price went down, the directors felt this was a good opportunity to buy, maybe bring the share price back up again, um, maybe take advantage of a, um, a dip in the market. Who knows, that could have been um, uh, when the uh, share price dipped um, as a result of the pandemic, when everybody's share prices dipped. So um, these guys, you know, they are paying out to the uh, to the shareholders. Uh, if you buy these guys, you will get a capital. Uh, sorry, you, uh, you may get capital growth. Um, you will get uh, an income. Uh, final section is the cash flow. Um, uh, and uh, just a sort of note to here, um, these guys, you know, they are very cash uh, uh, profitable. Um, they are generating cash. Um, which is good. That's these numbers up here. Uh, and if we look at the net cash flow from operations, that's the number down the bottom. Uh, again, they are all positive and reasonably strong. OK, so, yes, they are profitable. They're generating cash. They've got pretty strong cash flow. Um, uh, and that's all looking uh, pretty positive to me. What are they doing with that cash? Well, if we push down to the bottom half of the balance sheet, we'll try and just leave those numbers um, up at the very top. Um, uh, so what are they doing with that cash? Well, they are investing uh, in the future of the business. So here we see the investment activities, mainly purchase of property, plant and equipment. A um, little bit of business acquisition going on as well. Again, as we said, you know, these guys, you know, they are buying businesses, but they're also selling businesses as well. A couple of years ago, you know, they obviously had, you know, we're in we're in brand X. We don't want to be in brand X anymore. Uh, we'll get rid of it. And then, you know, all brand Y, we want to buy into brand Y. We bring it in. So there's a kind of a constant evolving as their strategy evolves but you know no massive numbers going on there um uh, in terms of you know you know relative to the size of this business um looking at the financing uh, if you look at these numbers here this is their refinancing so this is them issuing bonds and repaying bonds so in effect they've got some debt some of their debt becomes repayable they issue a bond which is basically borrowing money they borrow money over here repay it over there it's not a problem as long as they can service it, as long as they can pay the interest uh, which they can so those two numbers um you know sometimes you see them uh you know that they, they're raising more than they're repaying uh, which is where they are sort of increasing their debt uh, and sometimes they're repaying more than they're raising, in which case they are reducing their debt. And that's a kind of, you know, a cash decision along the way. But, you know, there is this refinancing going on and there is also um, these dividends. And you see, look at that nice, consistent dividend payer. And it can afford to be that consistent dividend payer as well. So uh, it's not like, you know, a lot of companies, BP, for example, Shell, they've had to cut their dividend because they just couldn't maintain it. They couldn't keep paying at the at the previous level these guys you know they've got a good interest cover um so you know if i was investing in them for that income i'd be pretty confident that that income wasn't going to go um uh, anywhere uh, in the near future um and and that's really you know and, and, you know the, the the bottom part just tells us you know how much cash they've got you know 2.6 billion uh, pounds you know that's a pretty healthy bank balance for a company like this um uh, which means that it's all looking pretty safe so these guys you know this this looks a pretty you know pretty nice solid um business um strong balance sheet <coughs> good cash flow profitable so here is um their share price as you mentioned if you'd invested when they uh, uh, when they floated you'd have made a huge amount of money um but that is obviously the benefit of hindsight doesn't really help us um we also have been looking backwards, um, so we haven't been looking forwards. So we don't know, uh, you know, does this number continue to kind of? Oops, uh, let's go back to that. Sorry. So you know, does this continue on its on its kind of trajectory like that, and, and it'll just kind of carry on going up? Does this sort of indicate a takeoff, and suddenly it's all going up, or is this actually a little bit of a dip, and suddenly it's all going to be going down, <coughs> and going down south? Well, uh, I. I you know, I'm not sure about going south. I'm not sure about the first two arrows, but this certainly sort of gives you, you know, if you kind of do your chartist approach, um, this certainly tells you that, you know, these guys are, you know, that they're not going to go anywhere. I think this is a, a pretty good, solid, uh, staple investment. P ratio of 32 times earnings. That's expensive. Um, you know, that's where the U.S. market is. And the U.S. market in recent days has been wobbling. Um, they got a dividend yield of 2%. Again, that's not too bad. So 32 times earnings is expensive. Um, a 2% dividend yield does not look too bad, although don't forget, you know, inflation running at, at 6%, it's not going to cover that. Um, so 
you know, I, I think, you know, this isn't a bargain um, by any means. This hasn't got screaming by written all over it. Also, if you're looking for your, your 20 bagger, uh, if you're out in the meme stocks and, and hunting in the Wild West, um, then this isn't going to excite you. Um, but this is certainly something which I would be prepared to have as part of a diversified portfolio, buy and hold. Uh, you just buy and you just don't look at it for 10, 15, 20 years. Just, you know, literally buy it. Don't even think about it. Write down why you bought it uh, and then just leave it uh, and ignore it. Um, and, you know, hopefully uh, in 10, 20, 30 years time, it'll double, doubled and, and, and maybe even doubled again. And you'll have a, a, you know, a reasonable part of your, you know, sort of it's the safe end of your um, uh, your investment portfolio, if that makes sense. So there okay. is Diageo. That's that's kind of my my analysis for you. I'm um, not a lot else I can uh, I can add to that. Looks yeah, that was that really was uh, I was going to say that's really informative. Right. And I suspect the. Uh, the PE ratio is high, probably because you know it's it's the second largest in the world. It's got good cash flow, good balance, their strong balance statement, uh, sorry, uh, f- strong balance sheet, um, and uh, you know it's in the um, alcoholic beverages, which uh, which has done pretty well during the COVID pandemic. So it looks like a a safe haven, hence why. So yeah, good uh, good analysis on the company like that. And look, if you if you what are your thoughts, right? If someone watching this knows the industry very well and like to share your thoughts with the community do do so and um if there is another company that you would like us to analyze for you whatever the reason um and if you can just leave a note in the comment section and also tell us your reason why and if there are any deadlines for you that may help uh, push your your request up the priority chain uh, we get a lot of these as ted says so we'll try to get to them as much as we can so until the next video thank you ted thank you everyone else for watching this Good to see you, baby.